Welcome. It all begins in the tube. I am Sarah Ramaya, Curriculum Design Strategist and Webinar Coordinator at ASRM. Our moderators for today's session are Dr. Dr. Sam Butts and Tia Jackson Bay. I'm going to introduce Dr. Sam Butts, give her the lead. But before we begin, please note this webinar was developed by the American Society for Reproductive Medicine as an educational resource and service to its members. While this webinar reflects the views of the panelists, it is not intended to be the only approved standard of practice or to dictate an exclusive course of treatment. Members should always use their best judgment in determining a course of action and be guided by the needs of the individual patient, available resources, and institutional or clinical practice limitations. Please note, all attendees will be muted except the presenters. Time at the end of the presentation will be reserved for questions. Please type a question in the chat window at any time. We will read as many selected questions as possible to the presenters during the allotted question and answer time. A recording of this webinar will be archived on the ASRM website in the coming weeks. Please watch your email for further notification. Our panelists for today, let me start with Dr. Butts. Dr. Butts is a professor of obstetrics and gynecology at Penn State College of Medicine, Chief of the Division of Reproductive Endocrinology and Infertility, and Vice Chair of Education for the Department of Obstetrics and Gynecology. She brings extensive experience providing the full spectrum of state-of-the-art infertility treatment services to meet the needs of patients seeking fertility care and those whose complex medical histories impact their reproductive health. In addition to her clinical work, she has dedicated a significant effort to the work of scientific societies, such as Associate Editor of Fertility and Sterility, on the Board of Directors of the Endocrine Society, the Board of Directors of the Society for Reproductive Endocrinology and Infertility, and as a past member of the Practice Committee of the American Society for Reproductive Medicine. As a reproductive epidemiologist, she has conducted clinical research investigating the impact of preconception prenatal exposures on fertility and markers of, of offspring growth, as well as the intersection between race, fertility, and early pregnancy outcomes. Dr. Butts will introduce our other panelists. Over to you, Dr. Butts. Great. Thank you, Sarah. Um, so uh, I just want to take this opportunity to uh, thank the ASRM and thank Sarah, who is supported the organization of this webinar and lots of other high yield uh, educational content. Um, I'm also fortunate to be joined by two outstanding uh, panelists. Uh, on the original webinar um, invitation, you might have seen that we would be joined by Dr. Natasha Seth McCoy, Dr. Tanya Wright, and Dr. Uh, Tia Jackson Bay. Dr. Wright um, is unable to join today. Um, uh, and hopefully we will be able to involve her in future educational content for ASRM, focusing on these very important topics. So let me introduce the, the rest of our outstanding panelists. Uh, Dr. Jackson Bay um, is a reproductive endocrinologist and infertility specialist at RMA of New York in New York City. She is passionate about reproductive justice and increasing access to fertility for all. Uh, through her work with multiple professional organizations, including the ASRM, she has been committed to eliminating health disparities in fertility care, uh, with a particular emphasis on uh, barriers to care and poor treatment outcomes for black women. Uh, Dr. Jackson Bay's professional interests include physician-patient education, IVF outcome improvement, global public health, and mentoring underrepresented college and medical students on careers in medicine. Uh, next is Dr. Natasha Seth McCoy, uh, DMP, MSN, FNP, WHMP, DC. Uh, Dr. McCoy is a board certified women's health nurse practitioner who has been currently practicing for 18 years as the inpatient gynecology nurse practitioner at the Hospital of the University of Pennsylvania. Uh, Natasha earned her BSN from Newman University 
MSN WHMP degree from the partnership program between Wilmington University and Planned Parenthood Federation of America, uh, a postmaster family nurse practitioner degree from Wilmington University, and a doctor of nursing practice from Wilmington University. She has 28 years experience in women's health in a variety of roles ranging from maternal child, uh, bedside nursing, community outreach, outpatient clinical practice, inpatient clinical practice, and nursing uh, faculty. So um, thank you to the, our, our, our outstanding panelists. Welcome to the attendees. Um, we want this webinar to be um, educational, but also engaging and interactive. Uh, you'll see as we go through the presentation that there are some opportunities for us to do polls, but there'll also be opportunities for you to uh, submit questions uh, in the chat, and we will try to address uh, as many as we can, given the time that we have. Um, I will start with um, my slide presentation, um, and and I should also just preface all of this again. You know, uh, we're the name is 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 catchy and, and perhaps a little cheeky, but we really wanted to have a conversation that focused on a number of things. We wanted to talk about uh, tubal pathology uh, and how it affects uh, fertility and uh, subfertility and challenge fertility in women. We, we understand that this is a wide reaching uh, problem for women, but we also understand that um, there is a disparity issue here and an, a health equity issue in which we find that um, African-American women and uh, uh, women who are of lower socioeconomic status tend to be disproportionately affected uh, by tubal disease that affects their fertility. So we want to have a conversation about that, but we also want to um, broaden the conversation, and we were very intentional in setting this uh, webinar up about uh, eliminating silos and shining a light on how we can work uh, interprofessionally and interdisciplinary in an interdisciplinary way to um, optimize uh, health outcomes for women. Uh, so with all of that, I will start. Okay. Uh, so. This uh, uh, this slide is an actual graphical depiction of the title of our talk. It really does depict how it all starts in the tube. This will be a review for many people on this uh, webinar, but it just emphasizes sort of how important the journey is um, for uh, gametes and early embryos uh, to traverse the fallopian tube and um, how much um, challenge there can be um, with fallopian tube disease uh, through intrinsic or extrinsic pelvic adhesions that may prevent normal transport of oocyte sperm or embryo through the fallopian tube. This uh, slide gives you a pie graph depiction of causes of infertility. And we can look at it in terms of the unit of measure being the female patient. We can look at it in terms of the unit of measure being a couple. Uh, no matter how you slice it, you can see that tubal and pelvic pathology are significant contributors to uh, uh, infertility and barriers to fertility um, for the patients that we see. Um, and this really gives you a sense of the scope of the problem. Um, I should also mention that it's been suggested that these proportions of tubal uh, and pelvic pathology are fairly durable across um, ages of women uh, when they present to us for care. But as I mentioned at the top of the talk, we do see differences in the proportion of um, tubal factor infertility uh, that our patients experience, and this is uh, significantly driven by race. This is a um, a table from a manuscript published um, from SART CORE's data uh, collected from between 1999 and 2000, uh, published by David Seifer and colleagues. And what you can see here is in this um, section looking at diagnosis. If you look at the proportion of African American women who were diagnosed with tubal factor, compared to the proportion of white women who were diagnosed with tubal factor receiving IVF in this time frame, you can see a significantly increased proportion 
of African American women with this diagnosis. I should point out that these uh, diagnoses were not meant to be mutually exclusive. As we all know, patients can have multiple diagnoses that bring us bring them to infertility care, but this is uh, uh, both highly statistically significant and um, a significant absolute difference uh, in tubal disease according to race. Um, unfortunately, it seems that these disparities have been pretty durable over time, whereas the data I just showed you was from 1999 to 2000 SART data. Uh, fast forward 15 years, data from the same uh, group of investigators looking at SART data from 2014 to 2016. And while the absolute difference in uh, tubal factor infertility according to race is not as wide as it was described uh, nearly 20 years ago, still highly significant and favoring more tubal factor infertility in uh, African-American women across all types looked at, whether it's uh, hydrosalpinx, uh, prior tubal ligation, or other causes. Um, and I think that this is important to think about when we get to other parts of the presentation in terms of how we um, counsel patients and get ahead of these uh, challenges with timely management uh, and diagnosis. So this slide gets into pathophysiology, which I won't spend too much time on because I know that this is well understood by many who are on the webinar. Um, but I think it's important to always call these things out um, in terms of how much impact they make. Um, pelvic inflammatory disease is one of the most important, if not the most important, um, uh, risk factor for uh, intrinsic and extrinsic tubal damage, just to give you some perspective on uh, the relative nature of this uh, risk factor. It's been suggested that after one episode of uh, PID, uh, there's about a 10% uh, risk of tubal factor infertility. After two episodes, that risk increases to 23 to 35%. And after three episodes, the risk is between 50 and 75%. Um, so this is a significant risk factor to uh, elicit and capture from our patients. Um, we also see the insidious and indolent nature of subclinical ascending pelvic infection. So a number of patients will not endorse a diagnosis of PID, but maybe have had uh, chlamydia in the past or may have never known or had a diagnosis of um, an STI. And we see tubal damage, which we um, can often assume is as a byproduct of exposure to chlamydia or, or gonorrhea that was subclinical in terms of symptoms. Uh, but wreaking significant havoc on uh, the reproductive tract uh, nonetheless. Uh, appendicitis with rupture is a significant risk factor as well. Uh, in one series, a four, or nearly five-fold increased risk of tubal factor infertility in women who had this exposure. Women with inflammatory bowel disease are also at risk. Endometriosis can be a risk both as pertains to intrinsic tubal damage and extrinsic tubal damage. Uh, and tubal surgery uh, as well as an important risk factor, um, both in terms of the types of surgery designed to restore tubal patencies, such as tubal anastomosis, and the types of surgery that are designed to uh, surgically address some of the damage that we've just alluded to, including fimbrioplasty and eosalpingostomy. And a history of ectopic pregnancy is, you know, we can consider it to be a cause and consequence of uh, tubal damage. Um, and significant risk of ectopic pregnancy occurring for people who have had histories of PID and subclinical um, uh, pelvic infections. And uh, of course, the management of ectopic pregnancy is also something very important to consider, uh, whether it's medical, surgical, and also eliciting details about that type of history we feel is critical in terms of early counseling patients and managing them and optimizing their fertility goals. Uh, I'll just reiterate uh, the importance of chlamydia infection, both to clinical and subclinical pelvic infection, 
As many of you know, chlamydia is the most common modifi notifiable condition in the United States. And uh, in 2016, 1.5 million cases were reported to the CDC. Uh, of the pelvic infections uh, that we think about uh, causing damage, chlamydia is the most common pathogen that's associated with this. And you can see that chlamydia is uh, on the rise. Next, I wanna talk a little bit about how we um, screen for and diagnose uh, tubal disease in clinical practice. Um, I'm gonna focus on radiologic um, measures, uh, keeping in mind that the gold standard for um, diagnosing tubal damage is to perform a diagnostic laparoscopy, but for reasons that I'm sure are, are clear to the audience, um, it's uh, not necessarily first line because of um, uh, you know, the, the potential uh, risk of surgery, what's involved, recovery, and things of that nature. So we start with other screening tests, uh, first and foremost, hysterosalpingogram or HSG. I placed up here a, um, uh, an image of an HSG, and I'll just talk about the pros and the cons. Um, as opposed to laparoscopy, which involves uh, general anesthesia and a surgical procedure, HSG is relatively uh, minimally invasive. It allows for assessment both of the fallopian tubes and the inside endometrial con uh, contour. Um, the cons of HSG um, are there can be significant false positives uh, either for tubal occlusion uh, in the range of about 15 to 30% and for endometrial pathology. So uh, if a fallopian tube is described as being occluded, it can be for reasons other than actually a true occlusion, such as um, a fallopian tube spasm or uh, debris trapping in the fallopian tube during the procedure. Uh, some patients get anxious about the potential for radiation exposure, but we can uh, reassure them that this is typically incredibly low and very brief exposure. This HSG uh, is showing us bilateral tubal occlusion with a left uh, mild hydrosalpinx that you can see given the caliber of the enlarged fallopian tube on the left. Next, I wanna uh, talk a little bit about sono uh, hysterosalpingogram or sono HSG. Um, this is a ultrasound-based assessment of um, uh, fallopian tube patency, and like HSG, it is minimally invasive. It does provide a little bit more information than um, the HSG test does, and the ability to provide information about endometrial, myometrial, and uh, ovarian assessment, since this is ultrasound-based and we are using transvaginal ultrasound uh, for assessment. The principle is um, at an appropriate time in the menstrual cycle, we um, insert a catheter uh, into the uterus and retrograde and still um, agitated saline. So we are instilling saline and air, and it is the assessment of those uh, properties as we are pushing both saline and air through the reproductive tract and the ability to see those signals that allows us to determine uh, tubal patency and the presence of endometrial pathology as well. Um, a, a downside is there is a bit of a learning curve to this procedure as there is with anything and the accuracy um, is felt to be significantly operator uh, dependent, uh, perhaps more so than HSG. So with all of that as background, what do, how do we take all of that information that we know about risk factors, um, uh, diagnose diagnostic tools and distill it towards the patient and patient counseling. I think one of the most important um, ways that I think about this uh, is that timely evaluation of our patients is incredibly critical to optimizing their fertility outcomes. So with, whether patients are coming to me as a reproductive endocrinologist and a subspecialist or uh, conferring with their family medicine doctor or their specialist OBGYN gynecologist, I think we should all be incredibly um, 
thoughtful and intentional about the histories that our patients are giving us and how that factors into uh, their risk for um, subfertility and barriers to fertility. So patients who are um, giving us a history of chlamydia, gonorrhea, or PID, inflammatory bowel disease, complex surgical history, endometriosis, tubal surgery, and certainly ectopic pregnancy, which um, Dr. Jackson Bay and Dr. Seth McCoy will get into in more depth, are the kind of patients, I think, who need to have counseling that is very targeted and very specific. I would argue that that counseling should even start uh, in the preconception time frame, so that patients can have their expectations managed and think about um, how to um, have as much agency as they can to engage subspecialists, start assessments in a timely fashion so that they are not delayed. Um, early evaluation is key, and I think um, most people would agree that anybody with an established barrier to fertility uh, should not have the same definitions of infertility applied as patients who don't have those established barriers. Uh, but don't just take my word for it. This is guidance that comes to us both from the American College of OBGYN and the ASRM, who um, published a joint recommendation in 2019, really drilling down on these uh, recommendations about the infertility workup um, targeted at women's health specialists. But I think we can all uh, learn something uh, from these guidelines. And two of the key points that I want to emphasize in the slide that were um, emphasized by the document uh, were that having to do with infertility evaluations and the need to offer them to any patient who by definition has, has infertility or is at high risk for infertility. Uh, there was a focus on age in, so, in some of these guidelines. I think these are things that people are familiar with. But I think what I really want to drive home here is that for women who have a condition known to cause infertility, uh, immediate evaluation and or consultation really should be discussed uh, because we know that to the extent that there are delays in care and management, that makes our ability to give patients effective treatment uh, that much less successful. So I'll come back to a slide that I introduced at the top of this talk, which is looking at um, disparities in tubal factor. Because, you know, again, I think this is an important clinical matter, but it's also a reproductive health equity matter as well. Uh, again, uh, one of the things we see is that tubal factor infertility in the largest infertility registry that we have access to is um, more uh, prevalent in African-American women. But if you look at the top of the slide, what you can also see is that African-American women are also significantly older than white patients when they um, initiated uh, IVF. So uh, nearly 10% of African-American were greater than 42, uh, twice as many compared to white patients were 41 to 42. So to the extent that we don't provide counseling in an expedited fashion and get patients to care quickly, it really does uh, influence uh, prognosis since we know that age is one of the most, if not the most specific factor for IVF outcomes. I'll go through the slide very quickly, which is just to reinforce something that's been published in uh, many sources, uh, which reinforces this as a problem that we all need to push back against, which is that Women of color tend to have longer times, um, durations of infertility prior to care seeking. So if you have one barrier to fertility, that can be a challenge. If you add on to that additional barriers, including delays in care and age, uh, that makes it that much more difficult for patients to have successful pregnancy. So we're gonna transition to a couple of poll questions. We'll, um, uh, I'll put out a question. We'll give you uh, a little bit of time to answer. Again, I want to keep us uh, on time. So um, this uh, first question uh, that I want to put out to the group based on your experience and what we've talked about so far uh, addresses a 26-year-old G0 with a history of two uh, chlamydial infections in the past. Um, she discontinued the pill eight months ago trying to achieve a pregnancy. My question to the group is, what would you recommend as a next step for her? 
uh, and the, the options are here. Continue trying for four more months and if no success, initiate fertility evaluation with the thought that she's got to have infertility after 12 months and that's the definition and we're sticking with it. Uh, schedule an HSG test as soon as possible or refer to an REI specialist for consultation. So that's the poll. I think Sarah's gonna give uh, audience members access to the poll. And there's no, you know, this is more about just gauging uh, the audience and seeing what, uh, what everybody thinks. All right, Sarah, I'm assuming you've, you've posed the poll. And so these are our responses. So it's, most people selected option number two, which was schedule an HSG as soon as possible. The next most popular response was continue trying for four more months and if no success, initiate fertility evaluation. And option three is um, refer to an REI specialist for consultation. So um, I'm just gonna write those responses down. I'm gonna keep us moving through the polls and then uh, we'll come back to these uh, as a platform for discussion. Next poll question. Um, what do you estimate is the approximate cost to the patient for an HSG test? And so our options are, and I'll read them, oh, here they are, um, $500, $2,500, $1,500, or none of the above since it's routinely covered by, and it's a little cut off here, but I'll read it, by all insurance types. So last, last option is, it's none of the above, insurance covers this routinely, no charge to the patient. All right, so I think most people answered that there was a not insignificant charge of $1,500 for the HSG test. Next is kind of evenly split between none of the above and 500, and a smaller uh, group said 2,500. Okay, uh, next poll question. Uh, this is an easy sort of uh, yes, no, or maybe. Does your state mandate that employers provide insurance that covers management and or diagnosis of infertility? And so it's gonna be a yes, no, or I don't know. Okay, so it's about almost evenly split, but most people uh, saying no, some people saying yes and others don't know. Um, so in the interest of time, um, I'm going to, um, Sarah, have us move through. We'll come back to this um, slide in a little bit more detail, but I, I will just say this is derived from resolve.org, which is an outstanding uh, education and advocacy organization for infertility. And this is a map that basically shows which states have fertility coverage for diagnosis, uh, for treatment, and the types of treatment. Um, so yellow states um, have law, have infertility insurance laws, and then depending on the dot that's represented, um, it's either IVF laws or fertility and or fertility preservation laws in green. Uh, and this is something that we can certainly come back to in a little bit more detail. But I think what we'll do is we're going to move forward to the next part of the webinar, focusing on uh, ectopic pregnancy. So we'll zoom through this poll. Uh, Sarah, can you advance us through this? And so, uh, and we can come back to it if we have time at the end. Okay, now I'm gonna pass it over to Dr. Jackson Bay and Dr. Seth McCoy to talk about ectopic pregnancy. Thank you so much, Dr. Butt. So I just wanted to talk a little bit about the risk diagnosis and management of tubal ectopic pregnancy. So just to start, as we mentioned earlier, fertilization of the egg actually occurs in the fallopian tube. As the fertilized ovum develops into an embryo, it is simultaneously traveling through the tube before it can reach the uterus for implantation. So it just shows us how important um, how important the fallopian tube is in reproduction. 
you know, when we talk about an ectopic pregnancy, ectopos, I believe it has a Greek origin, means um, in the wrong location. And that's exactly what an ectopic pregnancy is. A normal pregnancy should um, implant within the endometrium of the uterus. But unfortunately, ectopic pregnancies can be multiple different places, including in the ovary, um, in the fallopian tube, and any length of it, um, or even in the cervix, the peritoneum, um, and so uh, even in cesarean scar defects. Um, and so Ectopic pregnancies can also simultaneously occur with an intrauterine pregnancy, which is uh, referred to as a heterotopic pregnancy and is a little bit more rare. Um, but, you know, we will focus primarily on tubal ectopic pregnancy. And as, you know, many listening may understand that, you know, there may be some misconceptions about ectopic pregnancy. And just to clarify, it cannot be moved to another location. Um, and so once a pregnancy kind of establishes and it implants itself in the wrong location, unfortunately, um, the pregnancy is, is not considered viable. And for the safety of the uh, female has to be um, resolved. Um, another thing that I think is, um, you know, is often overlooked this day and age is that, you know, uh, ectopic pregnancy is really a gynecologic emergency. Um, at one point in time, this was a significant source of um, pregnancy morbidity and mortality, and we'll go over that as well, um, but it, it really is no laughing matter. The prevalence of ectopic pregnancy is about one to two percent of spontaneously conceived pregnancies, but unfortunately for those conceived with assisted reproductive technology, it does increase the risk somewhat to maybe about 4%. Heterotopic pregnancy, as I mentioned, this kind of concurrent intrauterine and extrauterine pregnancy um, is overall very rare, maybe seen in every one in 4,000 to 1 in 30,000 spontaneous pregnancies, but it does also increase with the, um, the incidence of ART usage. So ectopic remains a significant source of pregnancy-related morbidity and mortality. And in 2011 to 2013, um, you know, obviously it's almost 10 years ago at this point, but still a ruptured ectopic pregnancy accounted for almost 3% of all pregnancy-related deaths and was still the leading cause of hemorrhage-related mortality. So despite, you know, increases in diagnosis, with transvaginal ultrasound, the use of effective non-surgical management options, this remains a significant source of pregnancy-related morbidity and mortality. And so the prevalence, you know, may be overall low in the general population, but in a woman um, who is presenting to the emergency room with either abdominal pain or first trimester bleeding or both, the presence of ectop the prevalence of ectopic pregnancy may be as high as 18%. And even after that pregnancy resolves, that history of ectopic pregnancy increases her future risk. Having one prior ectopic pregnancy will increase your risk from that one to two percent up to. 10%, as you see the odds ratio here is three. Um, and as well as having more than one prior ectopic pregnancy, two or more increases their chances of future ectopic pregnancies quite significantly, up to 25%. So, you know, really, if you take nothing else away from today's lecture, I really want to convey that that first ectopic pregnancy is really a sentinel gynecologic event. Not only does it require immediate treatment, but really, you know, the focus should be, yes, let's resolve this pregnancy. Let's make sure that this person is out of danger. But then interpregnancy evaluation, counseling, and follow-up um, is going to be very important. Um, the goal is that, you know, you want to prevent recurrence um, by having this close follow-up. You also want to um, make sure that the patient understands not just what's happening to them at that time, but what does this mean for their future risk, their future health, and their future fertility. And in a way, you know, this can increase the, um, increase your suspicion for tubal factor infertility going forward. So it is important to you know, follow that person or make sure that they should know that they should be followed very closely with future pregnancies. And if they're having difficulty um, conceiving that they should seek treatment.
or in evaluation and treatment. So we talked a lot about the risk of um, ectopic pregnancies or, you know, the prevalence. Um, and even knowing that, even knowing that, you know, the risk for tubal factor disease actually do um, translate very clearly into the risk factors for ectopic pregnancy. You know, more than 50% of women who present with an ectopic pregnancy will have no known risk factors. So it is important to always just keep that on the differential. It's not going to be as glaringly obvious, uh, obvious, but once they have that history of an ectopic going forward, you really need to make sure that they're um, followed closely. Um, so a history of a prior ectopic pregnancy is a significant risk. Um, the diagnosis of infertility, um, irrespective of the etiology of infertility or of the method of um, conception, eventual pregnancy, does increase the risk factor for ectopic pregnancy. As I mentioned, um, uh, assisted reproductive technology uh, has been shown to increase the risk of ectopic, um, you know, if the patient has known tubal factor or if they're having an embryo transfer with more than one embryo, it can increase that risk. A history of pelvic inflammatory disease, as we mentioned, or ascending pelvic infections, um, as well as any history of intra-abdominal infection, scarring, if it was from a ruptured appendix, it was from inflammatory bowel disease, or extensive abdominal or pelvic surgery, they should all um, you know, just increase your suspicion that this person may be at risk in the future, as well as direct surgery on their fallopian tubes. Um, other risk factors include cigarette smoke, as well as advancing reproductive age above age 35. So IUD use actually lowers the risk of ectopic pregnancy. And you know the easiest way for you to think about that is it actually decreases the risk of any pregnancies. Um, and so that's really important to know. But of persons who are using an IUD, if they have a pregnancy that occurs with an IUD in place, about 50% of those are gonna be ectopic. So a higher percentage of those pregnancies will be ectopic, but overall their ectopic risk is low. Factors that are not associated with atopic pregnancy are oral contraceptive use, emergency contraception failure, um, so it means that they achieve pregnancy even after using like plan B. Um, history of a, a pregnancy termination is not correlated with ectopic pregnancy use there, or ectopic pregnancy risk. There was some um, thought that that could be a relation in the past, but it has not been shown um, to prove the test of time. History of pregnancy loss or miscarriage is also not associated with ectopic pregnancy risk, and neither is cesarean delivery alone. The definitive diagnosis of ectopic is really a sonographic pregnancy that is located outside of the uterus, and this has to be with a gestational sac or yolk sac. But you know, in trying to think of how do these patients present, there are a few different things that you need to consider. And so the history is most important. You know, are they having an absence of menses? Uh, are they using contraception or not? Um, do they express any known risk factors of ectopic pregnancy that we just reviewed or express a history of ectopic pregnancy? Maybe they, you know, thought they had a miscarriage, but they had an abdominal surgery to deal with that. And you may have to do a little bit of a deep dive and to figure out what happened there. Or are they under surveillance for an, a suspected ectopic or a pregnancy of unknown location? These would be all very important to know. In terms of the symptoms that they may present with, of course, abdominal pain is one of the most significant ones. Um, and it may be acute, you know, if there are signs of what we call an acute abdomen, that may be that there's either impending rupture or rupturing ectopic pregnancy, which is quite significant. Some patients will also have neck or shoulder pain. This is referred pain from the hemoperitoneum to irritating uh, the diaphragm. And so just something else to remember when you see patients who may fit this, um, this mold. Vaginal bleeding is a very common complaint. So if there's a positive pregnancy test and vaginal bleeding, you have to confirm the location of the pregnancy. Um, sometimes maybe just pregnancy-related symptoms um, in addition to some of these other things. And hemodynamic instability is also one of the most significant clinical symptoms. 
So we always start with evaluation. Someone presents, are they pregnant or not? You can, you know, in an emergency room, quite often they start with a urine, um, HCG. We may get serum if we see them in the office. Um, and it may be that you have to follow these measurements serially um, to really establish what's going on. Is it going up? Is it going down? Has it plateaued? The next step would be to obtain a transvaginal ultrasound. Um, and this is really our gold standard for evaluation of early pregnancy. It'll allow you to see are there, you know, this person is pregnant, but now the goal is to evaluate the location. Are there adnexal masses that are suspicious for a, an ectopic pregnancy? And really in order for you to call it um, an ectopic pregnancy, you should see the presence of not just a gestational sac, but also a yolk sac in the Nexa, um, or if a gestational sac and a yolk sac is present in the uterus, that typically confirms an intrauterine pregnancy. We always avoid trying to, um, you know, decrease the suspicion for a topic just based on a gestational sac in the uterus alone, um, because there can be the incidence of pseudo sac or heterotopic pregnancy. Um, sometimes you can't quite make the diagnosis of intrauterine versus extrauterine based on the ultrasound, and they may fall in this category of pregnancy of unknown location, but your suspicion should always be that this could be an ectopic that we just are not seeing. As well, on ultrasound, you may be able to detect hemoperitoneum, which in a setting of a positive pregnancy test, vaginal bleeding, um, and you know potentially abdominal pain should be evaluated and potentially managed surgically. So we'll talk a little bit about what are the management options for ectopic pregnancy. You know, there is a role for expectant management, although it is very limited. Um, and it may be because there's just a very low beta HCG um, or, you know, at the second HCG check, the beta is already falling maybe quite precipitously. Um, these patients, you know, if you're considering expectant management should be really clinically stable, obviously hemodynamically stable, quite reliable for follow-up because they need to be followed serially with beta HCGs until the pregnancy has resolved. Their risk for rupture remains until the pregnancy has resolved. Moving on, the medical management of ectopic pregnancy is with medication called methotrexate. And so this is a folate antagonist that binds to dihydrofolate reductase and inhibits DNA synthesis, repair, and therefore cell replication. So I always explain it to my patients that um, it, it you know, prevents rapidly dividing cells from being able to reproduce and that's how it is able to um, stop the growth of the pregnancy but that means it may also have an effect on other proliferating tissue. Think of the bone marrow, the epithelium of the skin and the lungs, um, the oral and GI mucosa, um, and so therefore some of the side effects that you would see may be related to which other tissues are affected. Um, there is also some direct hepatotoxicity, and so if the patient has um, liver disease or has known renal disease, kidney disease, then this may not be the best option for them because it is renally excreted and you need to be able to, um, to get rid of the methotrexate and avoid buildup. So a lot of times when we think about use of methotrexate or medical management of ectopic pregnancies, this is kind of what's glued in a lot of um, women health providers' head is, you know, can you or can't you not use it? There are absolute and relative contraindications. Obviously, if there's evidence of an intrauterine pregnancy, this is not the appropriate um, course of um, pregnancy termination or management. Um, but then some other, you know, active pulmonary peptic ulcer um, disease. If the patient is, you know, with a new pregnancy but actively breastfeeding, if there's any evidence of um, hemodynamic instability or that the pregnancy could be ruptured, then this is not going to be the most appropriate option. There are some that are relative contraindications, and this is where your clinical judgment may have to come in, um, but that includes cardiac activity seen on ultrasound, um, a, an initial high HCG. There's not a, a, a definite cutoff for what is considered high, so you may have to review your own institution's policies, but, you know, in general, over 5,000, in some places over 10,000, they would not consider methotrexate for that. If the ectopic is large in size, greater than four centimeters, you know, it may have a decreased risk of responding to methotrexate, and so you may have to consider whether surgical management may be better, 
or a different kind of methotrexate protocol. And also, you know, there's always going to be the risk of rupture even after medical treatment. And so if the patient um, would not refuse a blood transfusion in the event of rupture, then it might be best to take them for surgical management as opposed to the medical management. And so treatment success with methotrexate is really the resolution of the atopic pregnancy without the need for surgery. If surgery is eventually needed, then that is considered somewhat of a treatment failure. You know, methotrexate is extremely effective in, in treating um, atopic pregnancy, but there are a few things that can affect the efficacy. The starting HCG, how quickly the HCG rises, the size of the pregnancy, um, and whether or not there's cardiac activity are some of the markers that we may use to make the decision of whether this is best. You know, there's no clear consensus of methotrexate regimen for ectopic pregnancy. There's a lot of debate and, you know, even more papers about what is best, a single or a two-dose protocol. Um, there is some some data to suggest that a two-dose protocol may have greater success if the initial HCG is higher. Um, and I've you know, seen, or if you had a patient where um, you maybe want their HCG to resolve sooner, um, then you may employ a two-dose protocol. So we talk about this a lot, but you know, just for anyone who may not be familiar, methotrexate, um, after you give it, it's not just a magic bullet and you can't see the patient again. It does involve a lot of follow-up, and so that's something else to consider in terms of uh, whether or not they're a candidate for medical versus surgical management. So on the day that you plan to give it, we would consider that day one, you would measure a HCG and you would give the methotrexate, which is the intramuscular injection, um, with with 50 milligrams per meter squared of their body mass. Um, and so that is how it's dosed. Then they will always come back on day four for an additional um, beta HCG measurement. Um, but in a single dose protocol, they'll just get the labs and you know maybe have a check to make sure they're feeling okay and then they are not seen. But um, in a two dose protocol, you would then give another dose of methotrexate on day four. Either way, you'll see them back on day seven to measure the HCG again. And at this point, you want to know what is the difference um, or the decrease in HCG from day four to day seven. If it's more than 15%, then you continue to monitor weekly. But if it's less than 15%, that's seen as suboptimal and may be at risk of treatment failure. And so you would give another dose of methotrexate at that time, have them come back four days later for another consideration. Uh, if after four doses, the HCG still is not decreasing, or if at any point during this, the patient becomes hemodynamically unstable, their pain significantly increases, or they express a desire for surgery, then the next step would be surgical management. So as I've mentioned earlier, there are some factors to consider in terms of medical versus surgical management. And in terms of surgical management, you know, um, there are two main ways to accomplish this, both with the goal to remove the pregnancy. So this can either be by removing the entire tube, which is salpingectomy, or removing just the pregnancy but leaving the tube in situ, which is salpingostomy. And so with salpingectomy, removal of the fallopian tube, it can be accomplished either with an open um, approach, which is laparotomy or laparoscopy. You know, given the widespread use of minimally invasive of laparoscopy. It's a very safe and effective way to remove a tubal ectopic pregnancy. It may also kind of um, confer an additional benefit of being able to look around in the pelvis, see how extensive the damage is, um, evacuate hemoperitoneum, and in some cases the patient also um, desires sterilization at the same time, then that can be accomplished, whereas it you know, would have to be done at an interval for a medical management. Salpingostomy is a tubal conserving surgery, and so I, um, it's done much less frequently. Um, I've done it quite often, I think because I want to try to save people's fallopian tubes, um, if at all possible. Um, you know, at one point we thought that salpingostomy would just mean that you know, that tube would be damaged forever um, and that it would be unusable, but there have been, you know, cases of successful pregnancies after salpingostomy um, versus, you know, if both of their tubes are removed, say if they have two ectopic pregnancies, both managed surgically with salpingectomy, now they have tubal factor infertility. Um, and for some patients that 
you know, is a, a definitive end because they may not be able to afford the treatment IVF to overcome that infertility. So this decision should be based on um, whether or not the patient is clinically stable, if there's any damage to the fallopian tube or the extent of the damage, and a desire for future fertility. And it's accomplished by making a linear incision in the fallopian tube on the anti south pink side, and then you would use um, grasping forceps to remove the products of conception as best you can. Um, you would, you know, remove that from the abdomen, and then you can leave the tube without any sutures or anything on it. It'll um, make sure that it's um, a hemostatic before uh, leaving the surgery, um, but also, you know, it heals very well. And so, you know, as we've mentioned with so many other facets of infertility and reproductive health, you know, unfortunately, minority women, um, you know, also have some disparate outcomes when it comes to atopic pregnancy. Not only do they have higher rates of ectopic pregnancy, but they're more likely to suffer adverse outcomes of ectopic pregnancy, as well as an absolute higher risk of death from ectopic pregnancy, which is, you know, overall very surprising. But again, you know, if the science signs are not there or a patient doesn't understand the, the need or the cause of concern or follow-up, um, then, you know, this can be the result. Uh, there is a difference even in the types of treatments for ectopic pregnancy. Now, these studies can't, you know, always discern what was offered to the patient. All we know is what the outcome was. And so minority women are less likely to have tubal conserving therapy, either via salpingostomy or use of methotrexate, and are much more likely to have a salpingectomy to treat their ectopic pregnancy. So all of this to say that there is definitely a progression of of um, comprehensive GYN care, lots of, um, you know, misses and efficiencies, um, difficulties at this very basic level, which filter down into the disparities that we see in infertility care. You know, less use of effective contraception, higher rates of sexually transmitted infections, and then also misconceptions regarding sterilization in terms of um, is it reversible um, and things like that you know, this leads to a higher rate of tubal disease. And we see it in the, the diagnoses of in, the tubal factor, as well as the incidence and outcomes of ectopic pregnancy. And then based on how those things are managed, you know, women can have less access to infertility care, longer periods of infertility. Um, they're less referred for infertility evaluation and treatment. And this all leads to poorer outcomes. So tubal disease is an important contribution to um, disparities in infertility. There is a systematic progression from basic gynecologic care to infertility, and unfortunately, racial and ethnic minorities are disadvantaged throughout this continuum. So addressing these gynecologic care very early and often is necessary. And so I just wanted to offer a few things to consider at each level to potentially help us through this. Um, the gynecologic care, you know, we've seen that increasing confidence in the medical system is really not solely a burden on the healthcare system, but it is definitely something that needs to be done. Just given the historical context and even the recent context, what we've seen with, you know, COVID, um, both just the misinformation um, with the vaccination rates that are lagging, you know, patients really do have a, a, a mistrust of the medical system System, and unfortunately, that affects their outcomes. Um, so working on that is going to be important. Making sure that they have access to care, STI prevention, um, increased uptake of co effective contraception, um, and then enhance consenting and counseling regarding tubal sterilization. I'm also supportive of you know, pelvic ultrasound in routine gynecologic care that may be able to um, identify some of these factors, adnexal masses, hydrosalpinks, uh, uterine fibers early on so that they can be managed well in advance of trying for a family. Um, and then alternative methods of communication, we'll talk about this a little bit more, but telemedicine, texting, using patient portals can be very helpful to, um, to reach different populations as well, as well as the multidisciplinary approach and, and reducing medical comorbidities and making sure we have timely referrals.
For tubal disease, you know, some of the same factors apply, but if tubal disease is suspected, you know, making the referral to a subspecialist is important. Making sure that the patient knows that they should be seen very early for in surveillance of any um, further pregnancies um, and, and talk to them really about the options for a topic and what that could mean. I really would like to advocate um, for uh, interpregnancy evaluation after ectopic pregnancy um, so that the care just doesn't pick up again when they're pregnant, but you should really take that time in between pregnancies to evaluate them. And then lastly, about tubal factor and fertility, we've talked about a lot of these, um, but just different ways to expand treatment options to make treatment more affordable and expand um, access to care. Um, at the same time, I wanted to talk to um, Dr. Seth McCoy and just ask a little bit about what she sees in her women's health practice. Yes, can you hear me? Yes, I can. <laughs> okay, currently I am the inpatient GYN nurse practitioner at the hospital of the University of Pennsylvania. I work in collaboration with the residents as well as our attendings and fellows. Um, and I work with the benign GYN service, which means that I basically work with um, all the GYN patients that are not um, that are not oncology patients. Um, I work very closely with our quant book. Uh, with our pregnancies of unknown location, um, along with um, our, our multiple practices that we have in our GYN division, REI, as well as our um, private group and also our, our clinic group as well. Um, I've been there, like I said, for 18 years, and this is one of my main responsibilities is to basically run the quant book. And so I see plenty of pregnancies of unknown location and ectopic pregnancies as well. A little bit more about like your experience in terms of, you know, after they've been managed and there've been treatment, what is the post um, treatment follow-up and counseling like? We do make numerous calls to these patients, of course, because they're on our Quan book. Um, and just to make sure we have resolution, especially of, of those uh, patients who have um, ectopic pregnancies. Um, we actually um, had looked at, we did an innovation um, accelerator program. We actually started this and I, and I was actually a part of it with Dr. Ann Flynn um, and looking at um, exploring like follow-up rates in our pregnancies of unknown location due to the fact like you had said that there were uh, a high mortality rate of like 6.8 times um, uh, more mortality rate in the black population. And we saw that our patients were not following up. So we did this um, great program. Um, we started that in the fall of 2009. Um, in about February of 2020, we did a pilot, like a text pilot to see if we can, you know, get them to come back because we had a lot of people that was lost to follow up. Um, ended up actually developing something with our Way to Health, um, which is a texting platform. Um, and we started doing some actual manual things with that. Um, and then we actually instituted a, a way to health um, automated system to text our patients for follow up. Um, in the beginning, I should say, um, in um, around about, I would say March or so, we did the automation and we had like 26% of people who didn't show up. Um, and currently it's down to 14%. So we did see an increase, I mean, a decrease um, in, in loss to follow up patients. Yes. So um, I, think, I think that communication is a big like factor. That, yeah, that really gets to, you know, um, one following up is just an issue of safety at this point, but just being able to meet patients where they are and realize how widespread, you know, smartphones and texting is, and that may be a much easier way to get in contact with the population than phone calls or emails or, or snail mail. Um, so that's incredible. Yes. And so, you know, um, we actually, um, actually, Dr. Ann Flynn, um, she was doing her fellowship actually with um, our peace office, which is our family planning and pregnancy law center. And basically she, um, of course, graduated. <laughs> But we actually actually got a budget where we're going to continue on with our automation and our, um, um, we're going to try to add in more things. Of course, we know that COVID was horrible. Of course, when we it, like instituted this, this automation, it was phenomenal because we could give directions to the patient via text messaging. Um, 
tell them where to show, who to call to make appointments with. They could text us back um, in regards to symptoms that they were having. Um, and I guess it's a question of, well, how did we get that information? Um, and basically we got that information through um, our EPIC system, um, our GYN team, and we could actually um, speak to them real time. As we know, people tend to not answer their telephones. Um, so it was easier to communicate via text, especially if these women were at work. Yeah. Um, so, so I honestly think that, you know, this has helped us um, get our patients to come back for follow-up, but it also has helped us far as numerous phone calls. It's easy to send out an audit, you know, have an automated, you know, texting system. So it helped us as well as providers. Dr. Wow. McCoy, this is, uh, this is Dr. Butts. I, I also wanted to just jump in and, and congratulate you on this uh, amazing innovation. Um, and, uh, and also Dr. Jackson Bay for giving us a, a really great introduction to ectopic pregnancy management and, uh, and equity issues. There's a, um, there is a question in the chat that I just wanted to make sure we got to as we're sort of winding down. Um, and the question is, I'll put it out to the, to the whole group. Uh, do IUIs result in high ectopic pregnancies similar to after ART? I'll, I'll give Dr. Jackson Bay the first stab at this apple since she's just coming off her ectopic presentation. What do you think? Just rephrase the question for me. Yeah. Do IUIs result in high ectopic pregnancies similar to after ART? That's the question in the chat. Oh, in the chat. No, so not quite. So you know, it depends a little bit. I think the the focus of um, that higher risk of uh, ectopic pregnancy is really from in vitro fertilization. But, you know, as I mentioned, you know, persons who have the diagnosis of infertility, either tubal factor or otherwise, may have a higher risk of ectopic pregnancy, um, but I don't think it's quite as high as um, it is from IVF. You know, similarly, we are um, screening um, embryos more frequently now with pre-implantation genetic testing and a lot less frequently um, transferring more than one embryo at a time. So I believe that this, you know, is going to decrease our risk of ectopic pregnancies from IVF if it hasn't already been seen to be significant already. Um, so it, it's not necessarily that if you have IVF or you need an IUI, you have ectopic. The rate overall is still very low. It's just an additional risk factor. Thank you for that. I, I wanted to um, go back to uh, Dr. McCoy and ask a question about the project that you're working on and sort of connect it to uh, a point from Dr. Uh, Jackson Bay's presentation about sort of uh, post-ectopic surveillance and counseling. I'm wondering if there, you have any plans to follow the, uh, the patients that are being cared for and engaging in this way um, in terms of their sort of overall reproductive um, health once their uh, ectopic is treated successfully. Do you see an extension for um, what you're doing into that realm? Most definitely. I mean, when we did this innovation project, we was just basically focusing on follow up. Of course, there's many factors, you know, that um, contribute to patients being lost to follow up. And we wanted to look at the communication piece initially to get these patients back in. Um, but of course, we're going to extend it you know, to other uh, areas in which we can communicate with the patient to have the patient come in. Of course, we know patients get their ectopic pregnancies resolved and then they don't follow up. We might not see them until they're, they're pregnant again. So of course we can, we're gonna end up working on something like that. Mm -hmm. Yes. I think that would be great. I definitely love this tech system. I hope that something is in the works to, you know, write it up or, you know, just the report on your success from it. Um, but yeah, that next step might be, you know, the, an extension of the PUL or beta book clinic may be to, okay, these people need to come back in. Maybe they should have, you know, a, a one visit um, that focuses on counseling. Should they have, um, imaging or not, or something else, um, contraception management prior to having the next pregnancy. 
And um, Dr. Um, Jackson Bay, I just wanted to let you know that this was actually um, an abstract was actually submitted to the Society of Family Planning, and it will be presented at one of at their annual meeting by um, Dr. Ann Flynn. Um, it was accepted the abstract in regards to exploring follow up rates. Yes. That's awesome. Congratulations. Mm -hmm. Thank you. I, I think we might be at time. Uh, I don't see any other questions in the chat. Um, I want to thank Dr. Uh, McCoy and Dr. Jackson Bay for um, the wealth of knowledge and experience that they brought to this um, webinar. Uh, I will let either one of them part with any concluding thoughts that they might not have had a chance to touch on before we completely wrap. Thank you so much for having us. I hope it was informative um, and we really look forward to having these kind of sessions more in the future. Yes, thank you for letting. This is Dr. Seth McCoy. I would like to say thank you so much for allowing me to be part of this. Um, and um, I've had so much experience. So this is great that we're, we're having webinars about this. Thank you so much. And thank you for all the attendees. Yes. Uh, thank you, Dr. Butts, uh, Dr. Jackson Bay, and uh, Dr. McCoy. Um, you served as fantastic panelists to our attendees. Thank you for joining us. You will receive a survey right after this session and by email. Your feedback helps us give you the most relevant content and your input is appreciated. This session was recorded and will be available on our website in the near future. Please watch your email for notification. And for any further questions or comments, please don't hesitate to contact us at webinars at ASRM.org. This concludes the webinar. <laughs>